lost the power at that point. It lets quite a bit of stability. Initially, things stabilized for a little bit, but by the early, late 1920s, with the Wall Street crash in the early 1930s, there's a big problem of unstable governments and constantly switching governments, new elections, that sort of thing. It leads to electoral exhaustion. There's low turnout because people are just sick of voting and stuff because it's a federal system. They vote on local elections, federal elections, and they vote for the president. There's referendums and that. And because no party is able to command the majority, even before the Nazis, governments start abusing their, their power. They start using emergency legislation and stuff like that um, to pass laws. It's probably why people didn't react straight away to stop the Nazis when they started abusing their power. People were used to it at that point that other people had also like the Van Papen government and that had misused uh, emergency legislation that the very iconic encryption above the pillars um, as well Dem Deutsche Volke to the German people is the translation Dem is to the Volke you're probably aware from Volkswagen although you wouldn't use folk every day today to refer to people because it's kind of more the peasants, it's a folk and the, Ger the, the Nazis, for example, misused the expression. They idealized the folkish society as if they wanted German society to return to a basic agrarian society, you know, men going out to work, women in the kitchen and having children and stuff like that. Small rural communities, pure ethnic German sort of thing. Um, that, but the encryption was only added in 1917. It was originally a planned part of the building when it was built in the 1890s. But the emperor at the time of the German Empire and the, his uh, chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, opposed putting it up there. It sounded too democratic to them. So it was only added towards the end of the First World War. But the letterings had been cast long before that. And the lettering up there, it isn't actually engraved in the building. It's actually iron lettering that was uh, reclaimed iron from uh, cannons from Napoleon, Napoleon's armies that were melted down to make the lettering all sorts of disruptions they insisted on wearing uniforms so their brown shirt and their ss style uniforms when attending meetings when attending the parliamentary debate within the right side which was breaking the, the rules of the house and that so they were regularly ordered to leave and cause disruption and that they'd regularly disrupt speeches and stuff like that so that the actual business of the right side couldn't proceed and this then again was then used by nazi propaganda to say that the right side was powerless it was a worthless and failed institution and that democracy itself has failed. But yet, they were the guys creating the problems, meaning that the Reichstag um, couldn't function. They see a large boost in support then in early 1933, in January of 1933. They actually became the largest party within the Reichstag building. They had 38.38% uh, 38 of the votes and became the largest party within the Reichstag parliament. But it still didn't even give them an outright majority, of course. So they could either go try and govern as a minority co uh, government or they could form a coalition, which they did with the Nationalist Party and the Centrist Party. Now, the Nationalist Party was a more experienced government party. It was led by a guy called Van Papen. He had been in numerous governments up to that point. He'd, you know, he was quite a hardened politician to have governed in minority coalitions and minority governments and stuff like that. He really thought he could manipulate Hitler. The Nazis were really the new upstarts. They were the protest party. There was actually an attitude of people thinking, give the Nazis some power, you know, let them into government or whatever, and it'll quieten them down because they'll see it's not so easy, that we'll, you know, they'll be proven wrong, that they'll disappoint people as well because they won't be able to solve all of these problems with the sort of simple solutions they've been proposing. And what Papen taught that, so let Hitler become chancellor, I'll be vice chancellor, the Nazis will make up the numbers I need in parliament to government, I'll be the real power, Hitler's too, you know, inexperienced to be an effective politician. Um, and that obviously they were proven wrong. Um, Particularly with the fire in February of 1933, the Nazis moved very quickly. So on the 27th of February 1933, the Reichstag building was burnt down in the evening of the 27th of February. And it was this infamous Reichstag fire that was blamed on a Dutchman, a guy called Marinus van der Lubbe. He was a pretty convenient guy to find nearby. He was a member of the Communist Party. Um, he'd been overheard, or at least witnesses came forward to say they'd overheard him uh, making anti-Nazi anti statements, threatening to burn down important government buildings in days beforehand. He'd been overheard saying this in bars and places. Um, and, that, and on that evening, as the building wasn't even, you know, uh, they hadn't even punched the fire fully yet, um, Hitler and Joseph Goebbels showed up to blame it on the communists um, as well. So they were very opportunistic. But as I kind of mentioned a few of you at the start, this is a, a thing that's up for debate. I mean, some guides will go out and say, oh yeah, it was the Nazis because 
you know, it was four fires started simultaneously in that the building is too big for one man to start a sort of large fire that burnt it down in that. Um, the competing theories are that there's a building at the back that connects to the Reichstag building by a tunnel and that Hermann Goring, who was also a government ministry under the coalition government, he had offices at the back of the building and he would have let some brown shirts into the building by this underground tunnel and they could have started the fire and um, that burnt down the building. Um, still up for debate, as I said, I've been reading a few, uh, few books lately um, where they kind of say it probably was Marinus van de Lube. The Nazis might have allowed it to happen in that, they might have earlier knowledge of it or whatever, and they were just very opportunistic in terms of blaming it on the communists. Whoever it was, this is used as a big justification for the Nazis to, for their rise to power. <clears throat> as I mentioned, up to this point, there was almost a feeling as if it was almost civil war in Germany with the, the militias of the Communist Party and the Nazis fighting each other in the street and all the instability created by the Wall Street crash. And that, so again, when the Nazis come out with their propaganda saying that this is a communist revolution, the communists are trying to take over, people just about believe it because there's already this feeling of massive instability in Germany. So they blame it on the communists. They, they get Hindenburg, the president at the time, to implement emergency laws that allowed Hitler to rule by decree, suspend human rights. And they use it to ban the opposition communist party, round up members of the communist party in that. And in March of 1933, without any large debate or anything like that, the Reichstag passes the Enabling Act. Now, it was only meant to be for four years, but in 1934, there's a referendum in Germany. Of course, it's a totally sham referendum at that point because the Nazis control all the organs of the state in terms of the media and that. And it asks people, do you want to make Hitler Führer? Do you want to make him leader of Germany? Um, and of course, it's passed with 90% support and that. But really, it, it's, you know, the moment the Reichstag building is burnt down and they implement emergency laws, that's really considered, that's the Nazi rise to power. That's when they gain enough power to rule as a dictatorship and with absolute power um, in Germany. The Reichstag building itself, there were some basic repairs done to it after the Reichstag fire in February of 1933. The, the building wasn't used. The, the Reichstag parliament, it became meaningless first of all, but it, it occasionally convened for meetings with only Nazi party politicians represented. And they actually used to meet in an opera house. It used to be roughly where the chancellery, where the federal chancellery is today, over here. And it was just a backdrop for big speeches by Goebbels and uh, Goring and people like that for big events. Um, the Reichstag building itself then took more damage at the end of World War II when the Russian army attacked uh, Berlin. After they broke through the Oder Ness line um, in 1945, uh, throughout May they encircled Berlin and big pincer movement going around um, Berlin. And then they started to close the net on the center of Berlin. They came in in a big pincer movement from the southeast of Berlin and from the northwest. So they would have come roughly from this direction. There's a bridge over there, the Multerbrücke. Um, towards the end of May, they were approaching. They were approach, uh, They were sorry, advancing along the north bank of the river, trying to capture a bridge along the way. But of course, the defenders were blowing up the bridges as they were about to fall into Russian hands. But the Mulka Bucket here, they tried to blow it up, but it didn't fully collapse. So the Russians were able to repair it in about 12 hours, and they were able to cross the bridge there. But one of the flat towers, um, it used to be next to Bahnhof Shalokshagatun, which today it's actually part of the zoo. There's nothing really left of it today, but where it was is now actually part of Berlin City Zoo, close to where we were. That was still functioning and the artillery started targeting um, the Russian soldiers here, crossing the river here and crossing into this open area here, um, into the Tiergarten. So they were driven back for a while, and it was only uh, on about the 30th of April that they began their full assault on the Reichstag building. They actually set up their forward command base in the Swiss Embassy over here. Now this area, it wasn't as open as it is today. There was buildings kind of coming down two sides here. But if you think back to the Victory Column, the Victory Column used to be right in the middle here. And it used to be a big car park around, or sorry, big roundabout around it. So it was still a relatively open area. And the Russians very brutal fighting as they approached the Reichstag building. And once they're out in this open area here, um, German soldiers hiding out in the basement of the Reichstag building countered them. Sorry, yeah, parachuters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, um, but so German soldiers hanging on the basement of the Reichstag building attacked them and that slowed down their advance to the Reichstag building. Now they were under a lot of pressure to capture the Reichstag building. Stalin wanted them to do so for the 1st of May, International Workers' Day, big celebrations of the Soviet Union, big victory for them. You know, it was considered by Stalin that capturing the Reichstag building was capturing the heart of Berlin. Um, some Russian soldiers made it up into the roof for the evening of the 1st of May, but they were driven off uh, by attacks, uh, by counter-attacks from the German soldiers. 
It was only on the, the 2nd of May that very, the, the, the iconic photos of Russian soldiers waving the red flag um, over the Reichstag building were taken. By then it had taken a huge amount of damage. The original dome on top was almost completely destroyed and what was left of it was dismantled. And throughout the Cold War it was left without a dome. The Reichstag building was in West Berlin during the Cold War. It was just used as an exhibition space and museum and that. It was only after the fall of the Berlin Wall that the German government moved back here, at least the West German government moved back here to Berlin and made the Reichstag building the Parliament building again. And this new glass dome on top was designed by British architect Norman Foster. A lot of symbolism about it, the idea that you can see in, you can see down into the meeting chamber of the German Parliament, um, and that so it's meant to be transparent democratic architecture. Similar idea with the new government portrait here. So the Chancellery here is Angela Merkel committees meet. Again, a lot of glass you can see into the offices and that the idea of transparency. And as I mentioned, as you can see quite a bit going on around here and that this is all part of the day of the open door, they'll be open here till 6 p.m. And particularly the chancellery here, because this is what everyone wants to see, of course. This is set up for as many people as possible to go in, so you can go in and out quite quickly here. So if you are interested in seeing stuff after the tour, you could very easily come back here and check out the interior of the chancellery. They do funny little exhibitions in there for the day if you open door. You'll get to see presents that have been given to Angela Merkel by like George Bush and everything um, in there. Um, Where is he at? Yeah. Great head on, guys. What we'll do is we'll go back this way. You'll see there's a graveyard there. We'll be, you'll see from this corner where the fence is.